introduction. Let's see if I can get this right. Let's go straight in with pictures. Right. Uh, over. Those artists among us whose formation took place before the war recognized Cezanne as their tribal deity and their totem. With these startling words, Roger Fry opens his riveting account of Cezanne, published in 1927 and subtitled A Study of His Development. It's my conviction that this canonical text, oft quoted by scholars but relatively inaccessible to the general reader, deserves a new reading in the context of the recent retrospective, which has had all of us rethinking Cezanne. Fry's essay is a crucial item in the Cezanne bibliography, and despite the mountain of subsequent literature piled on top of it, it still has freshness and sparkle. Of course, in many respects it's dated, factually and theoretically, but that, if anything, makes it even more fascinating if we're trying to come to terms the archaeology of Cezanne interpretation. And I very much hope you will gather from my selected quotes that it deserves reading purely for its beauty as literature. Roger Fry was a seminal member of the Bloomsbury Group, and lovers of E.M. Forster or Virginia Woolf may recognize a similar intensity in language and ideas of this kindred spirit. I put up on the left a painting by Vanessa Bell of Roger Fry and Julian, her son, playing chess, 1933. And on the right, um, Fry's self-portrait of 1918 in the collection of his alma mater, King's College, Cambridge. Um, but few critics are remembered, let alone read, for their literary style. And if Fry's name still figures in the consciousness of art lovers, it is unlikely to be for his paintings either. He stands out thanks to his association with a critical theory known as formalism, and because of his crucial role in the introduction of post-impressionism, uh, a term he coined to the London art world. For a whole generation, it could be argued, he determined how Cezanne was seen. For the English, indeed, that he was seen at all. For he organized the landmark exhibition Manet and the Post-Impressionists, held in London in 1910. Both this exhibition and its sequel of 1912 created a press furore and notoriety comparable to the legendary 1913 Armoury show in this city. Virginia Woolf made the improbable claim that human nature changed in and around December 1910, her reflection on the impact of the exhibition. Kenneth Clark made the more credible claim that, insofar as taste can be changed by one man, was changed by Roger Fry. I, I talked about him to go about the archaeology of Cezanne interpretation. When I first gave this lecture at the Tate Gallery in London, it fell within a series of various different people's Cezanne. Degas, Emile Zola's, Maurice Merleau-Ponty's, Adrian Stokes's, and the list might have included various other users and abusers of the Cezanne myth. Maurice Denis, Ambrose Vollard, Rilke, Matisse, Picasso. And the fact that Cezanne has lent himself to such a variety of interpretations, that he has been tribal deity to such competing denominations, might prompt us to ask, can we possibly excavate a real Cezanne from the layers of commentary and adoption? The catalogue of the Philadelphia show sports a 50-page summary of the critical heritage the authors place Fry in a pivotal position, as he is seen to transform the quasi-mystical account of the symbolist devotees who befriended Cezanne in his final years, Emile Bernard and Maurice Denis, uh, a bathers by Maurice Denis of 1899 on the left, um, while Fry lays the ground for a century of formalist interpretation, culminating in the dialectical high modernism of Clement Greenberg, which I illustrate uh, with uh, Hans Hoffmann's Mecca of 1961. 
uh, no doubt it's highly appropriate that so messianic a figure as Cézanne should compete, uh, should spawn competing gospels. I can't say whether in this lecture I will help the situation by clarifying the contribution of one interpreter, or whether I'm making things worse for an artist, say, trying to come to terms with Cezanne's legacy. This afternoon I was in a cafe and somebody got chatting with somebody and uh, don't mind confiding that she was female and I, I kind of was enticing her to this evening's lecture. And she said, well, what's it about? I mean, is it it's just about Cezanne? And I said, well, if you really want to know what one dead forgotten English art critic, how one dead forgotten English art critic misinterpreted Cezanne, then I'm the man to tell you. But I don't see her in the audience. Um, I should make it clear at the outset that in this lecture, I'm as interested in the evangelist as the subject of his gospel. I want to ask how Cezanne came to fit Fry's needs and ideals so perfectly that he became, in his own words, his total. If I'm able to give any impression of the extraordinary vitality and verve of Fry's writing, you'll want to know something about the man himself. And an excellent place to start is with the quixotic description of Fry by the younger artist Paul Nash, who referred to him as the Quaker Jesuit. A sectarian contradiction in terms, this nonetheless indicates the effect of the dynamic Fry on contemporaries, bemused by his passionate, single-minded advocacy of contemporary art of the aesthetic cause. Nash is right to stress Fry's Quaker origins, for despite his early loss of faith, and from his family's point of view, deviant choice of career, the legacy of nonconformism and a Puritan upbringing were decisive in his intellectual and artistic outlook. A searching spirit and high-mindedness Humility and assuredness, democracy and elitism. These opposites are hallmarks both of Roger Fry's critical personality and more generally of the Bloomsbury group to which he belonged. Born in Highgate, which is now in North London in 1866, he grew up in a household that had little time for the visual arts. But as a boy, he shared with his father, the lawyer Sir Edward Fry, a passion for science, which he took as the first two parts of his unfinished tripos, Cambridge, the classic university note, as opposed to the romantic Oxford. He was always proud of the fact that his great-grandfather, Luke Howard, wrote a treatise on clouds and corresponded on that subject with Goethe. Fry tended to use scientific-sounding phrases like inevitable relations and plastic purity in his art writing. While the belief that one can approach art with a disinterested frame of mind, a problematic idea, underwrites his formless theory. Quote, one might compare the synthesis which Cezanne sought to the phenomenon of crystallization in a saturated solution. He indicated, according to this comparison, the nuclei whence the crystallization was destined to radiate throughout the solution. That's a description of Mont Saint Victoire, Large Pine, 1886-7. This combination of science and a Puritan heritage helps explain how it is that, despite the ancestry of formalism in the Epicurean aestheticism of the naught of the naughty nineties, Fry's outlook was animated by an altogether more idealistic and altruistic spirit, which was the spirit, coincidentally, of <coughs> Bloomsbury. On the left, Fry's Venice of 1899, and on the right, Bellini's Madonna, adoring the sleeping child in the Metropolitan Museum. After Cambridge, Fry set off Italy and France to complete his training as a painter. Contact with Bernard Berenson and his circle and other connoisseurs also launched him on a career as an art expert. His early reputation as a writer was for scholarly works on the old masters. A monograph on Bellini in 1899, important articles on Giotto in the following year, a critical edition of Sir Joshua Reynolds' Discourses. On the strength of these publications and his connoisseurial acumen, 
he took up the position of curator of European paintings at the Metropolitan Museum here in New York, uh, invited by the tyrannical uh, J.P. Morgan, and was offered the directorship, which he had to turn down because he was coming to New York, um, at the National Gallery in London. Now, these two aspects of his career, expert on the old masters and a contemporary painter, might never have dovetailed had it not been for Cezanne, on account of whom he made his first intervention as a champion of modern painting. Fry was a prime mover in the foundation of the Burlington magazine in, 18, in 1904. The following year, he saw his first Cezanne's in the new gallery in London. Uh, he had managed to miss the artist up until then, despite his travels. His initial response was lukewarm, but he rapidly came to terms with this artist precisely because of the kinship he was able to detect, not just with the Italian primitives he so favoured, but with the classical French tradition of Poussin, Claude, and, as illustrated here, Chardin. This is uh, Le Chateau des Cartes in London's National Gallery on the left. He was angered by the reactionary attitudes he encountered towards the painters we would now call the post-impressionists in the magazine he had helped establish. And he published a letter on the subject in the Burlington in March of 1908. A hostile reviewer had compared Signac, Gauguin, Cezanne unfavorably with the true impressionists, Monet, Renoir, and company. I have Monet's autumn effect at Argentuille of 1873 on the left, and a Gauguin Tahiti landscape on the right, the Gauguin's in the Lane the collection. And the Monet, like many of the paintings I'm showing, is in the Courtauld collection in London, a collection which Fry was uh, Fry advised in the formation of. So this this hostile reviewer, I can't remember his name, but I'm not fuddy duddy, saying that these 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 new people are not really the not the real McCoy, they're, they're decadent. Uh, they are um, well, Cezanne, despite his age um, and having exhibited with the Impressionists is not um, designated as a true Impressionist. On the contrary, these later artists are likened to the eclectics and the mannerists who followed in the wake of 15th century naturalism, on Tormo rather than the real Renaissance. Fry proposed an alternative historical model that sought to knock this dismissal on its head. He compared instead, he talked instead about um, Byzantine art, following the Impressionism of late Roman painting and its decadent naturalism. I illustrated with uh, a Pompeii painting of the first century on the left, showing a kind of voluptuous Roman naturalism. And on the right, a later Byzantine work. It's uh, uh, one of the mosaics of Ravenna. Uh, tighter, harder imagery. This model, Fry's model, recast the modern French movement Impressionism as sloppy and decadent in comparison with the much tougher, more centered, truly classical art that followed, epitomized by Cézanne. The idea of Cézanne as proto-Byzantine would recur in Fry's later writings. The composition of portrait of Achille en Père uh, in the Dorset, for instance, quote, is almost as elementary as a Byzantine icon. Cezanne's vision of landscape is one of, quote, primitive or almost Byzantine simplicity. Fry sells us the Cezanne, tightening up Impressionism, returning painting to more vital roots. In a 1918 lecture, Fry spoke of Cezanne's having recovered for modern art a whole lost language of form and color. Already as an art student in the 1890s, Fry was dissatisfied with Impressionism. Uh, it could already be regarded by younger spirits as an academic option in the Paris art scene, for the once revolutionary movement had spawned countless imitators. I illustrate the point with the uh, singer Sargent of the late 1870s in the Luxembourg Garden, gardens in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Uh, Sargent was an artist that Fry utterly despised. Uh, the painter Alfred Thornton, Thornton, a comrade of those years, 
later recalled that, quote, we dimly felt that more was required than an expression of surface appearances. But, as Fry said years later, we were groping for what Cezanne, of whom we had not then heard, had already rediscovered as the essential that lay behind the passing show of light and color. I have on the left Fry's uh, Black Sea Coast of 1911. The Burlington letter turned out to be the curtain raiser for a seminal event in 20th century British art. I've already mentioned it. It's the revolutionary exhibition, Manet and the Post-Impressionists, which Fry selected for the Grafton Galleries in 1910. On the right is a sketch he made of the installation of that exhibition. You can pick out some Matisse's, I'm sure. Um, this little picture is now in the collection of the Pompidou Centre in Paris. Cezanne was represented by 21 pictures his most substantial show in London to date. And there were comparable showings of Gauguin, Van Gogh, and even Matisse. The impact on public opinion was cataclysmic, as I've already mentioned, with howls of derision and anger in the press. Robert Ross, um, he was the trustee of Robert Ross of Oscar Wilde connection, critic of the Morning Post, can be quoted as a typical reaction. The emotions of these painters one of whom Van Gogh was a lunatic, are of no interest except to the student of pathology. Noting that the show opened on the 5th of November, which is Guy Fawkes Night in England, and commemorates the gunpowder plot of 1603, was proof to Ross's mind of the existence of a widespread plot to destroy the whole fabric of European painting. Uh, there was a political background to such antagonism, which relates to the prevailing fears of anarchism, trade union insurrection, and the suffragettes movement, suffragette movement, which had conservative opinion on tenter hooks. What concerns us in this lecture is how Fry's genuine shock at the reception of his exhibitions launched him uh, as, in a career as an advocate and polemicist for modern art, which he had not envisaged for himself. Publicly lampooned and branded as a charlatan, Fry's old persona as respectable connoisseur was in tatters. There can be no doubt, however, that he relished his role as controversialist. As he writes to his mother prior to the second 1912 exhibition, the British public has dozed off again since the last show and needs another electric shock. I hope I shall be able to provide it. A couple of Duncan Grants from around this time. Um, it was around this time that he refused the directorship of the Tate Gallery out of practical rather than political considerations, but the career choice was indicative, away from official establishment structures and towards greater engagement with the burgeoning London avant-garde. Because Fry was disappointed with the attitudes towards his new discoveries, Picasso and Matisse, by artist friends of his own generation, such as Walter Sickert and William Rothenstein, he came to associate more and more with younger artists and critics such as Duncan Grant. He threw himself into a frenzy of activities, mobilizing a new avant-garde, organizing a group to paint murals at an art school where he taught, setting up an ex exhibiting group at the Grafton Galleries, and founding the Omega Workshops. These are, on the left is a Duncan Grant inlaid tray from the Omega Workshops, and on the right, Vanessa Bell's textile. Omega ran from 1913 through the difficult war years until it was finally forced to close in 1919. It employed the Bloomsbury painters such as Bell and Grant, as well as a host of younger artists, and played a decisive role in the formation of British modernism. I'll, have, I'll talk more about Omega in a moment. Um, just seeing a, 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 an inlaid tray by um, Duncan Grant forced me a complete, total irrelevance, but of the quip by the notorious um, anti-modernist contemporary uh, critic Brian Sewell who was writing off the work of uh, Howard Hodgkin who's a distant relation of Roger Fry he said um, that his works are Bloomsbury tree, Bloomsbury tea trays some chairs and tables by Fry on the left and his portrait of Clive Bell on the right. 
In proportion as he increased his commitment to and involvement with young living art and to the cause of modernism, Fry also bolstered and intensified the radical aspect of his critical theory, his formalism. Max Beerbohm picked up on the theoretical extremism of the Bloomsbury critics. Fry and his younger colleague Clive Bell, who was the husband of Vanessa Bell, who was the foster sister of Virginia Woolf. And here's a, here's a, a quote from Bo, uh, Max Beerbohm. Quote, Mr. Clive Bell, I always think that when one feels one's been carrying a theory too far, then's the time to carry it a little further. Mr. Roger Fry, a little? Good heavens, man, are you growing old? Significant form, the buzz phrase of Bloomsbury formalism, was coined by Bell in his book, Art of 1914. Quote, what quality is common to Santa Sophia and the windows of Chartres? Mexican sculpture, a Persian bowl, Chinese carpets, Giotto's frescoes of Padua, and the masterpieces of Poussin, Piero de la Francesca, and Cezanne. Only one answer seems possible, significant form. In each, lines and colors combine in a particular way. Certain forms and relations of forms stir our aesthetic emotions. While Fry sometimes used this phrase, significant form, he was more fond of a term which he adapted for his own use, plasticity. Here's a typical use of the word in his Cezanne book. Nothing could be more explicit, more legible than the plasticity of this design, where everything keeps its exact position and where the volumes have the exact space to, in which to evolve. Just to compare the preferred words of these two critics and their connotations is to highlight the difference in quality and subtlety of the two writers. Bell's significant form was a dogma. Aesthetic experience was almost confined to the thrill of recognition. And he reckoned one was either born with a faculty or not. One could not acquire it. By contrast, for Fry's plasticity was more the basis of a technique of probing and elucidating and teasing out the salient qualities of a given work. For all that he had a reputation for authoritarianism, Fry was actually a remarkably flexible critic admitting changes in taste and strategy in the course of his practice. The hallmark of formalism, whether Bell's, Fry's, or anyone else's, is the exclusion, or at the very least, radical devotion of content, the divorce of art from morality or sentiment or symbolic or literary association. This has an obvious and crucial bearing on Fry's interpretation of Cezanne as an artist struggling against the temptations of romantic poetic creation to realize instead his true nature as an artist of pure plasticity. I, I have two of Cezanne's early works, Murder of 1870 on the left, and on the right, um, Abduction, um, which is 1867, and which significantly uh, used to belong uh, in the collection of uh, Maynard Keynes, who was uh, of course, a key member of the Bloomsbury group. Uh, Fry's idea is that Cezanne is a classic artist, but that, quote, all great classics are made by the repression of a romantic. One need look no further than the Cezanne book for an example of formalist exclusion in extremis. Writing about the series of still lifes of skulls at the turn of the century, Fry declared, it is needless to say that for Cezanne at this period, a skull was merely a complicated variation upon the spear. And he continued, by this time he had definitely abjured all suggestion of poetic or dramatic illusion. He'd arrived at what was to be his most characteristic conception, namely that the deepest emotions could only exude like a perfume. It is his own image from form considered in its pure essence and without reference to associated ideas. That Fry would have felt this extreme and provocative statement to be crucial to his argument is borne out by the cover of his Cezanne book, published at the Hogarth Press by his friends Leonard and Virginia Woolf. The drawing, featuring the skull motif so prominently, was by Fry himself, improvised in the manner of the master. Fry did not restrict such formalist reading 
perhaps we should say misreading, to modern artists like Cezanne, whose avowed aim, or so at least Fry believed, was to eschew the sentimental associations of subject. Just as his admiration for the old masters, for the classical tradition, led him forward to Cezanne, so his take on Cezanne was projected backwards. So it is that we find him writing about uh, a Poussin painting, um, the Achilles discovered among the daughters of Lycomedon, which I'm afraid I don't have a slide. Fry denigrates the subject and its psychology as boring, but extols its plastic and spatial relations. Quote, whatever Poussin may have thought of the matter, and I suspect he would have been speechless with indignation at my analysis, the story of Achilles was merely a pretext for a purely plastic construction. So formalism subsequently got its bad name for just this sort of polemically excessive dismissal of content. With hindsight, we can see that Fry was offering a corrective to the opposite extreme embodied in Victorian attitudes towards art, which Bloomsbury believed still held sway. Bloomsbury can almost be summed up as a systematic assault on old values, and it's hard not to see Fry's critique of the moralizing aspects of a Ruskin or a Tolstoy in the spirit of Lytton Strachey's eminent Victorians, that landmark in iconoclastic biography. Ironically, Fry took from Tolstoy the idea that art is primarily the communication of emotion while jettisoning Tolstoy's view that good art is art with noble ideas. Now, just as formalism was a pendulum swing away from the non-visual, traditional attitude towards art, so more recently it has engendered a sharp reaction in the opposite direction, away from the abstract, non-literary approach encouraged by Fry. Fry, for whom the skull was a complicated variation upon the sphere, helped initiate a century of formalist criticism. Uh, Maya Shapiro, in turn, could read profound psychological and iconographical meanings into something as apparently harmless or uh, neutral um, as Cezanne's adoption of apples as a motif. And Robert Rosenblum, an art historian, one could argue in the mold of Shapiro, has in fact pointed out that Cezanne's skull series followed fast on the death of the artist's mother in 1897 and the sale of a much-loved family house, the Juste de Buffon. In other words, uh, biographical information that refutes uh, Fry's formalist misreading demotion of the poetic, literary, associative uh, aspect of Cezanne's subject. Virginia Woolf characteristically found a perfect metaphor for Fry's critical practice. Commenting on his way of reading literature, to which he extended his formalist principles, she said that he looked at the carpet from the wrong side, but he made it for that very reason display unexpected patterns, and many of his theories held good for both arts, design, rhythm, textures. There they are again, in Flaubert as in Cezanne. The Cezanne book does indeed climax the comparison of these two men, uh, Flaubert and Cezanne, quote, both protagonists in that thrilling epic of individual prowess against the herd which marks the history of French art in the 19th century. Again, there's an element of redress, of historical corrective. In previous centuries, art had been read as if literature. Now is the chance to absorb literature as if it were design or music. Uh, but we should not doubt that his formalist sensibility was absolutely in earnest. He did indeed believe in such a thing as abstract literature and was obsessed with Mallarmé, working for years on a set of translations of this untranslatable poet. He told Vanessa Bell that Mallarmé was the purest poet that ever was, in the same sort of way as Cézanne was, in the end, the purest of painters. Um, with all this concern with purity, with art purged of reference and association, and with this abstract reading of the art of the past, it's no wonder that Fry experimented with abstraction in painting too. Here are two works of the year 1915. He expressed tentative approval of Kandinsky, 
Um, while the Tate owns a work called Essay in Abstract Design in Oils and Seven Bus Tickets. But for Fry and other Bloomsbury painters, the key words were essay and design. They did not feel obliged to stay with abstraction once it was attained. On the contrary, their art reverted to a more classical idiom, but marking a similar swing to that of the Ecole de Paris in the post-war years. A point that can be made by comparing the uh, a Vanessa Bell on the left, abstract painting of 1914, a nude of the 1920s on the right. By the time he came to write his Cezanne book, Fry had considerably cooled in his attitude towards the avant-garde. I had to admit to myself how much nearer Cezanne was to Poussin than to the Salon d'Automne. Writing of the deformations introduced by Cezanne almost as an unconscious response to a need for the most evident formal harmony, Fry complains that we have seen many similar deformations since Cezanne's day, sometimes justified and sometimes mere responses to the <coughs> demands of fashion, for that which nothing more tiresome can be imagined. A deformation which is not an imaginative and harmonic necessity is only a piece of snobbish orthodoxy. Ironically, of course, in dismissing post Cezanne painting in such a way, uh, he comes to echo that fuddy duddy who's looking at post impressionism as a decline from, from impressionism. He does not allow uh, his Cezanne to be tarnished by the inadequacies of post Cezanne paintings. And thinking, no doubt, of cubism. Here we see a bra on the left, small round table of 1911, which uh, shows its affinity with uh, um, Cezanne's still life of 1902. Quote: Since Cezanne's day, there has been there have been other construction, there have been other constructions as complex and as well poised, but this has, I think, been accomplished at too great a sacrifice to the dictates of sensibility with too great a denial of vital quality in the forms. And it is due entirely to Cezanne's influence that any such constructions have been attempted. He it was who first, among moderns at all events, conceived this method of organizing the infinite complexity of appearances by referring to it as a geometrical scaffolding. You see how his influence on Clement Greenberg is acute in that kind of writing. In thus rescuing Cezanne from his own legacy, Fry conforms to the plea of his colleague, Valdemar Georges, editor of the journal L'Amour de l'Art, in which Fry's Cezanne book first appeared as notes accompanying uh, reproductions of works in the Pellerin collection. The Pellerin collection, I, I would remind you, will be the subject of uh, a lecture by Karen Wilkin here on the 20th of November. According to Valdemar Georges, uh, Cezanne the milch cow of modern painting has won the right to be loved or hated for himself. But I don't think too much should be made of Fry's swing away from abstraction or holding back from subsequent modernist departures. He was no post-modernist. He'd come to Cezanne as a lover of a certain kind of classic art. But his modernism, in fact, all along, entailed a critique of modernity. The mission of a great artist like Cezanne is to re-establish modern technological man's connection with lost or obscured sensuality, with art's primitive roots. The profound ill ease with modernity and industrialism and the nostalgia for a lost classical equilibrium is to be found in, to be found in Fry's outlook. It's also there in other giants of the modern movement, in such contemporaries of Fry's as T.S. Eliot and Igor Stravinsky. Um, for Fry, um, compared with Eliot, at least, Fry was politically progressive, although his progressiveness was, was that of Bloomsbury, far from revolutionary and tinged with a certain snobbery. Fry himself was able to savor the irony of Cezanne's combining revolutionary aesthetics with bourgeois Catholicism and reaction. Views. Um, I put up on the left 
uh, tureen, a soup tureen by Roger Fry done at the um, Omega workshops. And on the right I have Cezanne's Man in a Blue Smock. Why? Because Fry idealized races and individuals. He believed were living life more fully than decadent technological modern Western man. His abhorrence of vulgar modernity bred a particular disdain for America, uh, made worse by his unhappy short tenure at the Metropolitan Museum and his unhappy relations with Pierpoint Morgan. In contrast, the Provence of Paul Cézanne is idealized for its closeness to the soil and to classical order. Cézanne remained always a true Provençal, and in Provence, as has often been pointed out, the distinction of the classes is hardly felt. Though Cézanne belonged to the bourgeoisie, there was much of the simplicity and directness of the peasant and artisan in his outlook. In 1919, Fry intensified his involvement with Provence through his friendship with Charles Meron, the translator of the Brunsby Orphans into French, and in fact bought a Mars belonging to Meron's in-laws in which he could escape and paint the same landscape as his hero Cézanne. It's interesting though that in spite of the intensity of Fry's identification with Cézanne, his painting style has none of the toughness of his mentors or any of the modern painters he extolled in his critical writings. Um, T. E. Hume, the poet and theorist associated with the cutting edge vortices group, wrote of Fry's achieving, quote, the extraordinary feat of adapting the austere Cezanne into something quite fitted for chocolate boxes. <laughs> Two paintings that are of, of Provence by, by Roger Fry. But to return to this point about Oh. Yeah, there we are. To return to this whole point about primitivism, um, the whole ethos of the Omega workshop was to stem the tide of slickness and impersonality in industrial design by insisting on tactile, robust, rough qualities in the handicrafts. That's why I was showing this. Uh, Yeah, that's why I was showing that a moment ago by Fry. Uh, sorry to force you to do that more than once. Um, Fry was a pioneer in the appreciation of both primitive art and children's art. He staged exhibitions of children's art at the Omega workshops. On the right is a drawing by a little girl, um, and extolled. Um, and on the right, and on, the, on the left is um, a photograph of a Bloomsbury design for a, uh, a nursery. And he also extolled African sculpture at the expense of Greek. We have a habit of thinking that the power to create expressive plastic form is one of the greatest of human achievements. And the names of great sculptors are handed down from generation to generation. So that it seems unfair to be forced to admit that certain nameless savages have possessed this power not only in higher degree than we at this moment, but that, but than we as a nation have ever possessed it. He reckons, however, that these makers lack in consciousness, by the way, I'm showing a fan reliquary figure that's in the Met, that these makers uh, lack in conscious critical appreciation and comparison, and that this lack in, is in fact crucially linked to the special feeling for form that comes out in their work. Quote, it is likely enough that the Negro artist, although capable of such profound imaginative understanding of form, would accept our cheapest illusionist art with humble enthusiasm. It's not our concern here that Fry exhibits the racial prejudices of his age, even while challenging its aesthetic prejudices. What's relevant is the conundrum raised by his critical theory, the conflict of conscious and unconscious in the creation of art, which is at once classic and primitive structured and spontaneous. As early as 1910, Fry wrote that Cézanne, quote, has that supreme spontaneity as though he had almost made himself the passive, half-conscious instrument of some directing power. 
the art historian Richard Schiff has commented that it's a problematic notion to act in such a way that, make, that one makes oneself passive. But this is in fact the essence of Roger Fry's interpretation of Cezanne. It's what made Cezanne of such supreme importance to him. Obviously, Cezanne was no nameless savage. Nonetheless, we constantly have indications of an acute tension between conscious and unconscious, intellect and sensibility. Fry extols the concordance which we find in Cezanne between an intellect rigorous, abstract and exacting to a degree, and a sensibility of extreme delicacy and quickness of response. What Cezanne is doing is presented as a highly intellectual, philosophically, philosophical, abstracting exercise. And yet he does it almost as if under some sort of anesthetic. An unfortunate analogy, perhaps, when dealing with aesthetic emotion. Allow me to offer a rather long quote from the Cezanne book, in which Fry speculates about Cezanne's modus operandi. You will see that it's a key passage. Quote, we may describe the process by which such a picture, the still life with compotier fruit and grass of 1879 to 82, is arrived at in some such way as this. The actual objects presented to the artist's vision are first deprived of all those specific characters by which we ordinarily apprehend their concrete existence. They're reduced to pure elements of space and volume. In this abstract world, these elements are perfectly coordinated and organized by the artist's sensible intelligence. They attain logical consistency. These abstractions are then brought back into the concrete world of real things, not by giving them back their specific peculiarities, but by expressing them in an incessantly varying and shifting texture. They retain their abstract intelligibility, their immunity to the human mind, and regain that reality of actual things which is absent from all abstractions. But Fry admits that he describes the process of, of abstraction in slow motion, warning us of the distortion that this entails. Quote, of course, in laying all this out, one is falsifying the actual processes of the artist's mind, in reality, the processes go on simultaneously and unconsciously. Indeed, the unconsciousness is essential to the nervous vitality of the textures. We can see more clearly, therefore, why abstract painting had so little appeal for Fry. Its diffuse and gratuitous nature limits the possibilities for that intensity that arises from the process of abstraction. It is in the expression of his idea, in the creation of a harmony and parallel with nature, that the higher degree of abstraction, the supraconsciousness, emerges. The extraordinary sensibility of his reaction to actual vision of no matter what phenomenon. This famous maxim of Cezanne's, that art is a harmony and parallel with nature, is actually used as the epigraph of Fry's book. And we can see why it's of such a suggestive, pregnant phrase for him. It presents Cezanne in a desperate search for principles of plastic construction. Thus his other great maxim, treat nature by means of the cylinder, the sphere, the cone. But at the same time, Fry notes Cezanne's loathing of imitation of conventional naturalism. Describing the portrait of Madame Cezanne in a red dress, now in the, Mus the Metropolitan Museum, Fry declares, the transposition of all the data of nature into values of plastic color is here complete. The result is as far from the scene it describes as music. There is no inducement to the mind to retrace the steps the artist has taken and to reconstruct from his image the actual woman posing in her salon. A horror of diffuseness on Fry's part explains not just his short-lived enthusiasm for abstract painting, but also his attitude towards the vexed issue of Cezanne's Impressionism. You remember in the Burlington letter, he was already talking about post-Impressionists tightening up the vision of the Impressionists. Now he's 
more explicit as to why and how Cezanne resists its fleeting surface sensations, its loss of the structure and centeredness, centeredness which are so important to him. The Impressionists, such as Monet again, Rouen, Cathedral of 1840, 1894, the Impressionists, Fry argues, were more concerned to seize the full complexity of the colored mosaic of vision than to isolate and emphasize those indications in the total complex which are evocative of plastic form. But this aim could not altogether satisfy such a nature as Cezanne's. The intellect is bound to seek for articulations. Without organization, without articulation, the intellect gets no leverage. And with Cezanne, the intellect, or to be more exact, the intellectual part of his sensual reactions, claimed its full rights. He always saw, however dimly, behind this veil, an architecture and a logic which appealed to his most intimate feelings. But unlike Maurice Denis, whose seminal essay on Cézanne, Fry translated for the Burlington in 1910, Fry does not write off Cézanne's Impressionist phase. On the contrary, because his real bugbear is the early romantic Cézanne with his pseudo-Baroque inventions, he recognizes Cézanne's Impressionism as the turning point in his career. Thanks to Pizarro in Fry's account, Cézanne learned the humility necessary to become a great artist. Humility in relation to his themes and means. I have on the left Pizarro's Hermitage in the Guggenheim, and on the right um, Cézanne's Auvers in the Chicago Art Institute from his uh, period under uh, period in under Pizarro's tutelage. But Fry never allows his hero to be taught too much by another artist, especially a living artist and an impressionist to boot. Cezanne's real education comes from within his own work. While such approach makes formalism highly suspect, it is this conviction which led to Fry's highly original observation that Cezanne's watercolors were crucial to the evolution of his mature style. This medium allowed for certain reticence which are must let much less admissible in oil painting, Fry writes, and thus suited his humble search for essence. The color may stand for a plane in the picture surface, but it is only, as it were, by a tacit convention with the spectator that it does so. It never denies its actual existence on the surface of the paper. Humility is the crucial character trait of genius, according to Fry. The conviction behind each brushstroke has to be won from nature at every step, and he will do nothing except at the dictation of a conviction. But he adds, this would not have been true of his youth. With such pictures as Pastoral, 1817, and Dorsey, in his earlier works, Cézanne affected an almost florid and exuberant curvature modeled upon that of the Baroque painters, but without ever attaining to their elegant incontinence. It was, one may suspect, the expression rather of his willed ambition than of his fundamental sensibility to form. Under Pizarro's influence, he developed a new conception of external vision and became, of necessity, far less conscious of his handling. He had, as it were, to leave his hand to manage. Free from conscious interference, in other words, Cézanne's genuine style, his handwriting, was able to emerge. And that genuine style could not have been further from the Baroque manner to which he had earlier aspired. The direction of the brush strokes is carried through without regard to the contours of objects, exact opposites of Baroque handling. Back again with that uh, still life of compotier, fruit and glass. It's Fry's conviction that the true personality of the artist, his genius, his style, comes out almost unconsciously when it's least forced. That is why he places such emphasis on this, this notion of handwriting, or écriture, to use the French word, as he does. 
He cherishes the sketch or unfinished work, reminding us of his background in connoisseurship and the Sherlock Holmes methods of detection advanced by Giovanni Bellini, uh, Giovanni Morelli, that great pioneer of scientific attribution. But Fry's elevation of the slight also bolsters this almost ethic. It is in still life, he writes, that we frequently catch the purest self-revelation of the artist. In any other subject, humanity intervenes. In the traditional canon, history painting, the sort of heroic subject Cezanne wanted to create in his youth, was placed highest, while still life was the lowest of lowliest of genres. Fry inverts this in accordance with his formalist conviction concerning the irrelevance of subject. Compotier is thus treated to a nine-page analysis, the longest devoted to a single work in the book. Don't worry, I won't read it all to you. Um, this picture on the left, incidentally, was once owned by Gauguin. And um, in singling it out for special treatment, um, Cezanne uh, reminds us that this is the picture that Maurice Denis places on the easel in his famous painting, uh, Homage à Cézanne, um, for which I don't have a slide, but which I think you all know what it looks like. But for all his excitement with handwriting and throwaway subjects, Fry is no advocate of expressionism, or at least not in our accepted art historical use of that term. Partly this has to do with national prejudice. As much as he, as he was Francophile, he was Germanophobe, and expressionism was predominantly a Northern European phenomenon. Ironically, the word expressionist was almost nabbed for the post-impressionists. He was asked by a journalist for the name of the group gathered at the Grafton Galleries. Fry at first put forward expressionists, but was browbeaten into an anodyne alternative, which has stuck. Uh, so, uh, Fry would have resisted the idea that anguished or fast-flowing outpourings represent the real personality of, the, of an artist. Cezanne's true genius, after all, lies in his attainment of equilibrium, a harmony parallel with nature. Furthermore, Fry could not abide art where, as he put it, the artist leans out from the picture to nudge our elbow. His deep-seated antipathy towards the romantics, he never came to terms with Turner Delacroix, accounts for his problems with the early Cezanne. Cezanne at this period believed, writes Fry, Cezanne at this period believed himself to be a visionary. His imagination, nourished on poetry, aimed at something besides the plastic interpretation of actual appearances. This also accounts for, this antipathy towards expression also accounts for his ongoing problem with Van Gogh. Despite introducing him to the British public through his exhibitions, uh, Fry maintained that Van Gogh was much more of an illustrator than a plastic artist. And yet, accepting Fry's definition of classic art as depending on its formal organization in order to arouse emotion, it's difficult not to, not to see supreme uh, plastic values, as Fry would call them, in a typical Van Gogh, where emotion is so aroused by the tongue, the tight pulsating design. Fry's objection to poetic subjects conceived in the imagination and to the intrusion of extraneous emotions put him in a position where he was forced to marginalize a key aspect of Cezanne's output, the bathers. He was perplexed by the persistence of this theme into old age with the seeming return of his unrealized youthful ambitions. And he writes, those of us who love Cezanne to the point of infatuation find, no doubt, our profit even in these efforts of the aged artist, but good sense must prevent us from trying to impose them on the world at large, as we feel we have the right to do with regard to the masterpieces of portraiture and landscape. It's when he's forced to account for these aberrations Fry comes out with that extraordinary sentence that all great classics are made by the repression of a romantic. Fry's explanation of the bathers, which would come to upset the apple cart of his general interpretation, 
takes account of the artist's errant sexuality, but in a way which places the onus on quite mundane practicalities. Quote, one cannot doubt that throughout his life, Cezanne was violently drawn to the female form as a motive, he writes, because he was unable to work from a living model, <clears throat> save the odd one, quote, sufficiently deprived of charm to satisfy him. Don't have the um, standing new debating 98 and 99, but instead a, a seated male new from much earlier, but one um, equally uh, deprived of charm. Um, in other words, Cezanne is forced to revert to imagination, uh, not because he has abandoned the aesthetic development Fry has so lovingly charted, but because this is an exception that proves the rule. In the course of this argument, he makes one point which recalls Virginia Woolf's metaphor of the wrong side of the carpet. Quote, his plastic feeling would alone have urged him to the contemplation of forms so eminently suited to embody his ideas, his love of ample, simply defined volumes. In other words, it's the cart before the cart horse. And in a similar vein, in a letter to Robert Bridges, he asserted that, quote, the plasticity of the female figure is peculiarly adapted to pictorial design. This little inversion is, is how we would usually relate, in, in how we usually relate to art to life, encapsulates Fry's formalism to a T, reminding us of his links with a Puritan heritage, uh, but equally pinpointing the elegance of his idiosyncratic aestheticism. To paraphrase Oscar Wilde, human nature imitates art. In other words, the pictorial design doesn't match the human figure to which the artist is drawn, but the artist is drawn to the human figure because it's a good vehicle for plastic design. Fry, with considerable humility, actually has a let-out clause for the future to make what it will of the last phase of Cezanne's development, which would include the late favourites, works he himself cannot fully appreciate. He says, uh, if for us the great masterpieces of the penultimate period, like the card players, remain, and the Geoffroy, remain the supreme achievements of Cezanne's genius, one may nonetheless have a suspicion that for certain intelligences among posterity, the completest revelation of his spirit may be found in these latest creations. Without trying to sound cynical, such humility has another implication. We can imagine that were he writing about an artist he does not idealize to the same extent, he would simply have argued for a late falling away. He must protect his messiah from the faintest suspicion of an ignoble end. But speaking as a job in critic myself, I think he does this with great ingenuity and dignity. It's not just the preoccupation with the bather theme that bothers Fry about the last phase of, of Cezanne. Whatever the theme or technique, there is, he notes, and this makes particular sense in relation to the watercolour of Mont Saint Victoire of 1900 in the Tate Gallery of London, there is, quote, a tendency to break up the volumes, to arrive almost at a refusal to accept the unity of each object, to allow the planes to move freely in space. We get, in fact, a kind of abstract system of plastic rhythms from which we can no doubt build up the separate volumes for ourselves, but in which these are not clearly enforced on us. This last development does not come as a shock. Fry has prepared us for it with his novel treatment of the watercolours and his theory of the integration of colour and plane. <clears throat> but nonetheless, he himself appears phased by it. Are we not back with the old problem of diffuseness? Remember, this is <coughs> Fry's complaint with Impressionism. Cezanne, as far as he has argued, is the apostle of wholeness, creating order out of his myriad sensations, seeing the architecture beneath the veil. Fry can see the architecture beneath the veil of these late works, the invisible links the viewer has been left to fill in for himself. But in his own work, and the work of contemporaries, he will champion, he's not willing to act on its implications. 
were one to write of this great formalist as a formalist, one might compare him to Moses who glimpses the promised land but does not enter. Based on his own experiences as a painter and aesthete, and worked through his idealized view of Cezanne, Fry presented a riveting account of a painter's mind, one which I've tried to reconstruct. At the end of the day, though, who is that artist? Cezanne, or Roger Fry himself, projected onto a fictional character, Roger Fry's Cezanne. I leave you with a visual tease to complement this intellectual one. One of these slides is Cezanne's self-portrait in the National Gallery, and the other is Fry's copy of the self-portrait in the Courtauld Institute. Because you're all New York Studio School painters, or treasured guests, I mean, tell you which is which. Thank you.